So Professor Carl G. Jung, the Swiss psychotherapist and co-founder with Sigmund Freud of the 20th century psychiatry, was persuaded that such methods of prediction do produce meaningful results. His work had brought him into repeated contact with the stranger shores of the human psyche, and he was aware that the lives of many people are punctuated by the phenomena of coincidences and fulfilled prophecies. So Jung became convinced that some linking process distinct from causality but complementary to it is at work in the universe and that its manifestation is in seeming collaboration between human psyche and the external world. Well, he named this principle synchronicity. Welcome back to the channel, ladies and gentlemen. It is Tuesday, and you know what that means. Time to continue our series in the mysteries of the unexplained and continuing the section entitled Prophecy Beyond the Walls of Time. And today, as you can see, I was already diving in there to a section inside the section of prophecy entitled Synchronicity and giving us an explanation and an understanding of where synchronicities came from and what they are. And so that's what we'll be beginning with today, as well as going into the Plowboy Prophet, a story of 1467 prophecy, as well as some of an explanation of the prophecies of Nostradamus. And now I know we all have our different opinions on these kind of things. And like I said before, and last time, this is just for fun. I found this interesting personally, and I thought I'd share it with you here in a series on the channel, because this gives us a lot to think about, because it's all connected, ladies and gentlemen, as we know, and as we're about to discuss with the topic of synchronicity. So thank you for being here. I love and appreciate each and every one of you. Hope you are comfy and have yourself a beverage. It's a beautiful day here, regardless of the weather. Hope it's a beautiful day wherever you are, regardless of the weather. So let's dive into this. Synchronicity. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you think of when you hear the word synchronicity? I know I think of like winks from the universe or from God, the Tao, great spirit, whatever you want to call it, Atum, that is telling us that we are picking up on something. We're noticing something. And it's, like I said, a hint or a wink. But let's see what the book here has to teach us about synchronicity the vexing thing it begins by saying and once again reading from this for purposes of teaching and commentary and expanding the mind so that through this increased awareness we can increase hopefully the quality of our lives at times that can be more difficult or more easy than other times but this is why we work on it regardless the vexing thing, it begins by saying, about synchronicity, about techniques of prediction that rely on signs of whatever kind, is that no connections seem to exist between the signs and what they signify. In the disposition of planets, or the condition of a sheep's liver, in the way birds fly or tea leaves settle in the cup. See, this goes back to the prophecy that we were talking about before and oracles and prophets and mystics and, you know, fortune tellers, future casters, whatever you want to call it. Astrologers. See, I find astrology and astrotheology to be the more um, interesting versions of this to me as compared to the way that the birds fly or what you find in the bowels of beasts being the weirdest one to me. But I'm sure each of these has their own backgrounds and explanations and stories. And as I say, I'm no master. I'm just here discovering with you on this journey. So let's learn together, ladies and gentlemen. And please add your knowledge in the comments below. It helps us all. The tea leaves settle in the cup. In none of these traditional modes of prediction, there is conceivable relationship with war or death, with fortune in love or money, or with the outcome of any other future event, which is what most of prediction, prophecy, or even the attempt of manifesting is really focused on in the discovery 
or the correct path towards fortune, love, money, or certain outcomes of future events that you would like to create or transpire. Such devices, however, are still considered to be useful omens. Professor Carl G. Young, and this is where you caught me in the beginning, we'll go back over this real quick, because this is important. The Swiss psychotherapist and co-founder with Sigmund Freud of the 20th century, of 20th century psychiatry, so remember, it was only established not that long ago, and if uh, you go check out the entire incredible documentary, which I do have in a playlist on this channel called Ultimate Documentary. So if you want to scroll down there and check that out, or it's in other places, but documentary called Century of the Self. Century of the Self, and it will tell you all about the Swiss psychotherapist Carl G. Jung and Sigmund Freud and how they used their understanding of psychoanalysis and human psychology, psychology, sorry, psychiatry to change reality. But I'll leave that up to you because that's a deep subject. But he was persuaded that such methods of prediction do produce meaningful results, going back to the tea leaves or the astrology. And his work had brought him into repeated contact with the stranger shores of the human psyche. He was delving into the mystical through a practical or scientific approach. And he was aware that the lives of many human people are punctuated by the phenomena of coincidences and fulfilled prophecies. And so to me, this is synchronicity. So I'm like, there are no coincidences. It is just up to our ability to see the connection. And it's so amazing when you look at reality and you can zoom out from your subjective human perspective of being separate from everything and time is, you know, if you can zoom out from all of this and then begin to look at the interlinkings and the inner workings of all things happening throughout time, it is mind boggling mind blowing it is amazing to see the connections that exist beyond where we would normally see them and some would say oh that's just looking for patterns and finding them where you want to well i'm open to either side of the deb debate i mean holding two opposing opinions at one time seems to be the better way to go based on older philosophies than my own so with that being said he, this founder of psychiatry and psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, psychology, persuaded, was persuaded that this weird phenomena of coincidences and connections and fulfilled prophecies was a reality. And so Jung became convinced that some linking process distinct from causality but complementary to it so causality separate from it but complementary to it is at work in the universe and that its manifestation is in seeming collaboration between our psyche our mind our thoughts our noticing our awareness and the external world so what is actually taking place in our connection to that? And he named this principle synchronicity. And he spent much of the later part of his life trying to explain its workings. Which books I have yet to come across and be introduced to. I'm actually very fascinating in studying all up on synchronicity. So leave me a comment below if you are aware of the books that Dr. Jung left us about this principle. However, let us continue. In doing so, he was keenly aware of the difficulty of describing a non-causal process 
for an audience that had been deeply conditioned by an exclusively causal view of the world. See, even he knew, and I think he was a part of the reason, that we have been conditioned as a society to have a certain psychological view, perspective, on the world, to where we can only see certain things based on the, you know, the causality that we had been taught. And we went into, when reading into the, what was it, the wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins talking about this, this idea between things that are, you know, solid, that can be proven, and then things that are spiritual, mystical, so to speak, non-physical, that can't really have solid proof, but there is plenty of evidence for its existence. And this could be easily argued by people who are totally coming to it from an exclusively causal view of the world, rather than the non-causality. Now, let me continue before this gets any more confusing from my ramblings. And if you've been here before, you know, I'm not doing this like an audiobook. I'm doing this for personal exploration and seeing where the mind goes. So I like to ramble here and there to see what we get out of it. Hopefully we get value. Hopefully you're getting value. And if you are, thank you for being here. Now, in doing so, he was keenly aware of the difficulty of describing a non-causal process to the whole academic and the rest of us, most of us who have been conditioned by an exclusively causal view from society of the world. His systematic essay on the subject entitled Synchronicity and a Causal Connecting Principle and published in 1952 was a heroic attempt to avoid giving the impression that the agents of synchronicity are causal agents. <clears throat> in Jung's view, the agents of synchronicity are to be found in what he called the archetypes of the human psyche. And that is one of his big um, teachings, Carl Jung, was the, the archetypes of the human psyche. Oh, coming to say hi, Beans? And so, let's see if it gets into the archetypes as the kitten comes to say hello. So an archetype. An archetype appears to the conscious mind as a special kind of symbol. It is not conceived by the conscious mind, but it rises into it, fully potent, from what Jung called the collective unconscious. And this is something we also talked about in the wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins previously. The collective unconscious, or our collective awareness, as humanity, and, you know, some people, many people, I believe, have either not thought of this, this collective unconscious and conscious that we all share, and also may have heard of it, but think it's just totally ridiculous. But as we've seen in the hundredth monkey story, or many other phase transition, quote unquote, events, that this is a real thing that plays a role in our reality. And to us, especially as a collective. So, this collective subconscious, an archetype, let's see, from what Jung called the collective unconscious. So these archetypes rise into our conscious mind from the collective unconscious mind. Conscious mean, this is just my own definition, but conscious meaning we are directly aware of it, unconscious meaning we are not directly aware of it. And so, this is very interesting, it is not conceived, but rises into it fully potent, from what Jung called the collective unconscious, a rest, a, re, a repository, there we go, 
Almost said that wrong. A repository, ladies and gentlemen, of archetypes held in common by all of mankind. And so just, of all, just as all humans have certain genetic features in common, so they share, Jung found, a wealth of psychological material that becomes conscious only in dreams and reveries. Or like we discussed earlier on the Oracles of Delphi last week on this series, from mystical states of consciousness. The Oracle of Delphi, a priestess traditionally known as Pythonus, exercises her magical powers, having put herself under a spell by inhaling the fumes in the caves and chewing laurel leaves and many of these other things to achieve these altered states of consciousness in order to tap into this other realm of our collective unconsciousness or what sometimes referred to as the Akashic field, or the Akashic record. And so, let's see, this is very interesting when it comes to the part of dreams, as well as mystical waking states of consciousness, as compared to non-waking. And so, examples of the archetypal figures that Jung found reoccurring in his own dreams in the dreams of patients and in the folk stories and myths of every age and nation are those of the wise old man or woman, which is very interesting because I can think of so many characters that are that character like immediately. And so this is obviously an archetype. So the first archetype we were given is the wise old man or woman. Then the eternal mother the magical child, see instantly more characters like, oh yeah, the trickster, hmm? the, the tree, very interesting, the tree, and the mandala, a graphic pattern symbolizing the universe. Just as genes embody order, genes are orderly arrangements of DNA molecules and are themselves disposed in an orderly way in chromosomes. Very fascinating. And create orderly patterns of growth so archetypes embody order at the psychological level. And in their presence, new order ensues. At this point, Jung's difficulty was to explain how the archetype by virtue of its inherent order, creates order in a non-causal way. A medical example may provide an approximate model of this process. Penicillin is helpful in cases of bacterial infection because penicillin molecules, and once again, this is a very old book, so take that with a grain of salt, ladies and gentlemen. And so, but as the example here, penicillin molecules are partial match for molecules in the bacterial cell wall. When a bacterium is deceived by this near match into incorporating a penicillin molecule into its, cell, into its cell wall, the wall is weakened at that point because of the inexact fit and therefore ruptures, killing the bacteria. The penicillin molecule has been instrumental in this process, but not actively so in the presence of the penicillin molecule, the bacterium has developed a new fatality, fatally flawed molecule pattern. Thus, the role of the penicillin is contingent, but not causal. In a similar way, an archetype serves as a psychic catalyst in whose presence orderly psychological experiences unfold in a way that often entails the physical world, i.e. a synchronicity that you notice. How can this be possible? Another biological example may be helpful. It is established that some migratory birds are guided by the stars. The bird's genetic time, sense, and mental image of the star patterns can be considered at the psychic, as the psychic level. So the bird's genetic time sense, genetic memory, and mental image 
of the star patterns can be considered as the psychic level. The stars themselves represent the physical level. So it's a working between the two, see? The stars themselves represent the physical level. When the two levels mesh to put the birds on the proper route at the proper time, we see evidence of the psychic catalyst or archetype. And here, too, the archetypes, the genetic, you know, quote-unquote, the genetic inner clock and the mental image, are contingent, once again, but not causal. So in a similar way, many human beings responding to the force of inherited psychological patterns find themselves in various altering relationships with the external world. Jung himself was well aware that his theory was a tentative first step to the understanding of something profoundly difficult to formulate. The most important question he left unanswered, the real and precise nature of the synchronistic connection between the mind and the physical world. For Jung, this relationship was the psychological equivalent of the physicist's mathematical equations. And he realized that the lack of an appropriate contribution from mathematical physics rendered his theory incomplete as an attempt to account for the relative or partial identity of psyche and physical continuum. Wow. Wow, ladies and gentlemen. If there isn't an explanation of synchronicity, this is one. And so while the theory of synchronicity has not been proved right, and remember this book was from like the 70s, it has also not been proved wrong. And people may have genetic, archetypal, subconscious information that is related to their seeming ability to prophesy, foretell the future, or maybe just plainly see the connections underlying in the nature of reality, ladies and gentlemen. And that is a boom to synchronicity. That is a boom to synchronicity. And what is a synchronicity? And how does it work? Now let's finish today with a little story here in the section of prophecy. Once, you, once again, mysteries of the unexplained, ladies and gentlemen, entitled The Plowboy Prophet. Robert Nixon, a rural visionary who by reputation was held to be mentally retarded, was born around 1467 on a farm in the country of Cheshire, England. He began his working life as a plowboy, being too stupid, the book says, by all appearances, to do anything else. He was mostly a silent youth, though sometimes given to strange, incomprehensible babblings that were taken to be a sign of his limited mentality. I, I immediately was thinking how those that we have so long thought to be autistic or slow are also gifted with strange, incredible abilities. And I think this is another field that has had a lot of study in the time since the creation of this that is very interesting when it comes to, you know, superhuman abilities, um, or sometimes when people like to think back to previous golden ages when we have had certain abilities go dormant, like, you know, telecommunication or telekinesis and all of these kinds of things. However, and also going to prophecy and this connection of synchronicity. However. And then I thought of the Sufi and the whirling dervish and how they get, you know, uh, so many of their incredible poems and spiritual philosophical writings from these kinds of states, once again, same as the oracles and mystic states of consciousness that are usually, you know, obtained as incomprehensible babblings that need some kind of a translator. But eventually, 
we come to be something quite great. All right, let me continue and get through this so we can call it good for today. One day, however, this plowboy, Robert Nixon, way back in 1467, he was plowing a field and he paused in his work, looked around him in a strange way and exclaimed, Now Dick, now Harry. Oh, ill done, Dick. Oh, well done, Harry. Harry has gained the day. All with exclamation points. This outcry, more cogent than most, though still incomprehensible, puzzled Robert's fellow workers. But the next day, everything was made clear. At the very moment of Robert's strange seizure, King Richard III had been killed at Bosworth Field, and the victor of that decisive battle, Henry Tudor, or Tudor, T-U-D-O-R, was now proclaimed Henry of England, King Henry of England. Very interesting. Before long, the news of the bucolic seer reached the new king, who was much intrigued and wanted to meet him. An envoy was sent from London to escort Nixon back to the palace. Even before the envoy left the court, Robert knew he was coming and was thrown into a fit of great distress, running about the town of Over and crying out that Henry had sent for him and he would be clammed, starved to death. In the meantime, Henry decided on a method of testing the young prophet, and when Nixon was shown into his presence, the king appeared to be greatly troubled. He had lost a valuable diamond, he explained. Could Nixon help him locate it? Nixon calmly replied in the words of a proverb that those who, can, those who hide can find. Henry had, of course, hidden the diamond, and was so impressed, wow, he knew it, by the plowboy's answer, that he ordered a record to be made of everything the lad said. What he said, duly, interpreted, forecast, the English civil wars, the death and abdication of kings, the war with France. He also forecast that the town of Nantwich in Cheshire would be swept away by a flood. Wow. Though this had not yet happened. So this plowboy had the gift of quote-unquote prophecy, ladies and gentlemen. But the prophecy that most concerned Nixon was the most improbable of all, that he would starve to death in the royal palace. To allay these fears, Henry ordered that Nixon would be given all the food he wanted whenever he wanted it, an order that did not endear the strange young man to the royal kitchen, <laughs> whose staff, in any case, envied his privileges. One day, however, the king left London, leaving Robert in care of one of his officers to protect charge from the malice of the palace domestics the officer thoughtfully locked him safely in the king's own closet. The officer was also then called away from London on urgent business and forgot to leave the key or instructions for Robert's release. Wow. By the time he returned, the king, Robert, had starved to death. Charles Mackay, as comes to us from Charles Mackay, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds from page 277 to 80. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the story of the Plowboy Prophet, a rural visionary who seen when Henry Tudor was, or Tudor, was crowned King Henry after the defeat and death of Richard III at Bosworth Field the event was seen from far by a clairvoyant plowboy. And that is a little image there of that 
seen. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a boom to the mysteries of the unexplained and another part, part three on the section entitled Prophecies. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, we will begin diving into the prophecies of Nostradamus and see what we can get out of what we're given here in the mysteries of the unexplained. This one looks to be a couple pages. And then we get into an explanation of the immediate, intermediate present. That should be fascinating. The past, the past, the present, the future, is it all simultaneous? Depending on our current psyche, our perspective, our mind? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'll leave that up to you. As always, remember to seek to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment, through a greater awareness and understanding of the nature of ourselves and reality, so that through that awareness, we can increase the quality of our lives. And remember, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. It is our challenge of what we must create the ability within ourselves to bring to life. And then when we can do that, all the things we've been telling ourselves, oh, when I get this much and have that, and it all becomes irrelevant because then we are there. And then hopefully, much more or the rest of the journey is wonderful, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Thank you so much. I love and appreciate each and every one of you. Be sure to expand the description to get this book for yourself, to put it on your shelf so you can follow along in the future and have it for reference as well. And also a link to my Etsy shop and landscape paintings if you want to check that out and get some art on your walls like in the background. But also a link to C60 Purple Power, the most powerful antioxidant known to man. Give yourself the gift of health. Comes in 99% uh, sublimated in avocado, organic avocado oil, organic MCT coconut oil, which is great for the energy. But what we all need more of in our life is that organic extra virgin olive oil. It's also available for pets too. So... With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. I love and appreciate each and every one of you. And until next time, remember, seek to discover the lost wisdom of the ages, the lost mysteries of our history, and continue to be the change that you want to see and be the example that you want to set. Na -na 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 -na.